welcome to Talking Treats. This is a podcast brought to you by the Treats team, where we explore people's passions. We discuss the struggles of having a passion with different guests from around the world in order to learn the best way to enjoy, learn, and ultimately grow from our passions. My name is Carlos, as always, and today I'm joined by Sophie, who is actually the coordinator for the Treats charity program. And our special guest today is Joe Sparks, who will be having the chance to speak to him tonight about, uh, well, self-development, education, his collaboration with the charity, Teabag, um, and any kind of growth that we can see beyond the classroom. Joe is the CEO and founder of the Green Room Foundation, a school with an alternative approach to education. And he works across the UK as an educational trainer focusing on self-development. And he's a speaker for the Pixel Club, which is a school partnership network of over 2,500 schools and alternative provisions, sharing best practices to raise standards and to give students a better future and brighter hope. So how did Treats get to know Joe? He's a trustee of the Teabag charity in Ghana that Treats and perhaps some of you listeners have contributed to. That being said, welcome Joe. Hello, it's lovely <laughs> to be here. Thank you very lovely much to have for you. asking me. We want to know how you got involved with uh, Teabag Charity. As you know, we're, we collaborate from the Treats team quite actively with them. Um, what was your journey into that? And perhaps why did you decide over this charity uh, and other initiatives that you might have uh, you know, heard of? Yeah, I, um, I knew I wanted to I knew I wanted to do something different. I'd become a bit disillusioned with um, the education system uh, that, that kind of well, across the UK, um, I'm still passionate about it and I still believe in alternative education and making a difference and everything. But um, after 10 years, it, it just it just left me a little bit jaded and I needed something to, uh, I don't know, refresh me and, and, and make me, you know, see, I, I, want, I wanted to be inspired again. Um, and so I wanted to do some charity work, but then I, again, the, the, it, it's not easy to do charity work. It's not easy, easy to to just go to Africa and, and, and teach, it's, it's not an easy thing and nor should it be. It's not, uh, I think that kind of, that element of just us going over there to try and save something is not really that healthy and stuff. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I met Tom Yendel. Um, Tom Yendel is, is uh, you know, a trustee of Teabag and, and a really big deal. And he came to talk at one of my schools, my farm school. And we got talking and I said, I want to come to Ghana. And he said, okay, prove it then, uh, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Uh, and that was November, and in January I went there, and I went there with my co-founder um, and head teacher Richard, um, and I was just hooked. I just I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the village. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the whole thing. I just I don't know what it was. It just it just captured my heart in a way that um, I wasn't expecting, and and it sort of hasn't left my head since. Uh, I, I don't I don't know. It's not. It, it's weird. It's not. I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't think I'm doing anything particularly special there, but I'm, I'm the, the most important thing that I'm doing that I feel I'm doing is learning. I'm learning how to do international work. I'm learning how to, to, um, help, uh, improve without, well, improve the education outcomes of, of the young people out there without, changing the culture of, of the village and, and the wider community in Ghana, which I think is really important. And I'm learning from the Ghanaian teachers as well. And, and the, just the, everything, I just love it. I just absolutely love it. I'm just totally hooked. <laughs> nice. I can see you have some, some pictures also in the background. There's one of in Ghana. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's, um, yeah, that's not a plant that, that <laughs> that's a, <laughs> That was done by a, a foot and mouth painter called Joel. Um, so he is, um, uh, he paints with his mouth and he is uh, a lovely man. And yeah, and um, I, um, I was sort of hoping that he would give me a painting because we're such good friends. But as it turned out, he sold me a painting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I, didn't get, I, didn't, I didn't get a discount. Uh, he well, saw me coming. He was like, no, you're going to pay for this, mate. <laughs> So um, he's a, he's no. a businessman, right? And that's what you're teaching them. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was, it was, it was good. And um, now he's lovely. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I love that picture. I love it. It just, mm -hmm. it makes me, it makes me miss Ghana. But speaking of the painting, could you tell us a bit about the process of how, um, you know, a student goes into tea bag and how they leave, you know, 
what what kind of is the goal in in the end product of okay is it always uh, producing a painting is it uh getting basic education kind of walk us through that that process yeah okay it's a good question um so for a start i think it's i think it's ever changing and ever evolving like all education it's it's always kind of trying to raise standards and, and improve outcomes for young people um teabag is is is, is, is more than one thing. Um, so it originally started uh, by Roger Gilman, who's, who, who visited the, the, the village by accident, really, and wanting to swim and then met the people and then the rest is history. Uh, primarily, it was to improve the local schools um, in supporting, sponsoring children to go to school because it costs about five pounds a year to, for, for a kid to go to school there. Um, but then over the last 10 years, it's, uh, Teabag has evolved into something more in as much that we run a um, vocational college. So the vocational college um, is a skills based college and it teaches uh, construction and fashion and IT and uh, catering and electrical engineering and i know i'm going to forget stuff as long as like math and english as <laughs> yeah. well and um so in terms of the outcomes of the the students um I, I how i see it and and i'm sure my fellow trustees will all see something different um i see it as an opportunity to <clears throat> to make realistic change in the young people's lives so um primarily the the, the students come from really really kind of poor and tough backgrounds um certainly relative to 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 the western culture um their kind of entire family will sort of be surviving on about a dollar a day you know that's i mean i don't even think i don't i'm not even sure it's as much as that i think if you if you give a lot of these families a dollar a dollar a day it would actually improve their life so i mean it really is so small that it's you know it's not even worth calculating really um and then through the through the college and they're learning skills, um, so they have their, they take their exams and they and, and they learn these these skills, and also they just learn a lot about this being in college as well, how to look after themselves and being in a kind of education community, which I think really benefits them. Um, bearing in mind that a lot of these students would have not gone on to anything like university or anything like that, they would have they would have just gone into work. Uh, most of them still work with their families or or. Uh, if they have if they have any work or if they have any jobs they will do that um so when they leave the college they along with their educational um qualifications they certainly i think they have they leave with a work ethic and and, and um and a, and sort of a kind of drive to better their own lives and better their own selves and they can go out and earn hopefully a lot more than a dollar a day um whether that's through starting their own business which is something that i run with them um, or going on to further education or getting a job um, with a company that will benefit from the skills that they've learned. So, for example, if they've learned how to um, it, it, do the fashion, um, uh, the fashion courses, they, they could be taken on. Because uh, do you think that that's what the, the key thing that they're trying to, uh, let's say, find through the schooling system that you guys offer? Is that motivation? Is that drive? Um, or is, is the main skill that they're uh, searching for perhaps something else? I think that education is, is, is a kind of universal way to improve anybody's life. You go anywhere in the world and, and, and if you, um, you give them education, that, that improves most things, I think. Um, I think what I would like to see and what I'm trying to do with, with the charity is... Um, improve their outcomes through self-awareness so i want them to be i don't want them i want them to to be aware of where they are and to not just want to get a boat to europe or or, or escape yeah. to actually improve their own communities and improve their own lives in the country in in ghana and in and in their own villages as well I, that's that's what i'm really passionate about so i think that that's why i call it like realistic opportunities and realistic outcomes i don't see the um, so one of our most successful students, for example, a, a young lad called uh, Godfred, and he's not, you know, it's not right for me to call him a young lad. He's, he's, a, he's a man. He's a, he's a family man with, with married with, with kids. Um, but he uh, grew up in the village uh, in Mankwase and, 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 you know, went through school, but didn't have many 
prospects and, and there's not a lot of work in the village. Um, so he um, learned how to sew and became a tailor. And now he runs a business, a successful business in the village. He hasn't left. He hasn't gone to Accra. Uh, I think he went to, uh, did some further studying in Accra, but he came back to the village and runs his business. And if you, on a, any, any given Sunday, you'll see everyone going to church in, in Godfrey's clothes. You He's know. amazing. Um, I have beautiful outfits from yeah, him. Sophie, he made all my mom's yeah. curtains in, at the lodge and... He's so talented. I really, really love what he's doing. He's he's fantastic, and and that's and that's and I like he's a he's a real big success story for us. Mm. Um, and it's and it's not as simple as saying oh he you know he got he got he he, he earns money. It's not as simple as that. Um, it's more, um, you know, he still has to. I mean, twenty twenty would have been a really hard year for him. He wouldn't have made much money, and he would have and obviously with not nobody going anywhere that would have really hit him hard, but it's, it's, um, he's, what I like about it is he's in control of his own destiny. He's not living off handouts. He is, he's running his own business and the education that he learned with us and the opportunity. So we've, we've just, um, financed him kind of microfinanced him to, um, help, uh, fix the roof on his, on his, uh, workshop. Um, and again, we could have just done it and, and given it to him, but, um, we uh, we've kind of donated half of the money and given him a loan for the other half and he will pay back that loan with his income. And that's really important because yeah. um, it's, it's, it's so important for many different reasons. It's important for him to, to understand the value that, that we're not just going to give him the money. Um, but it's also important for the local villagers to understand that he's paid back this money and he will pay it back. I have absolutely no doubt about that. He will pay it back over the course of the next year. Um, and so, the, yeah, it's really important that he sort of stands on his own two feet yeah, um, it's a more sustainable approach now to Yeah, it is. Everything. And so and so that's that's yeah, that's what I'm really passionate about that we don't just um yeah, okay, if you go and visit there, you should take t-shirt t-shirts and shoes and hand them out and whatever because yeah, fine. But that's not going to change anyone's life. That's just going to give someone a t-shirt. What's going to change someone's life is, is an opportunity relevant to the society in which they live in. Um and then it's a mutually beneficial relationship that that people he people like us that go out there and and do the work we benefit hugely ourselves and they should benefit too and it's a it's a two-way street and that's how i see it working um, i think this is a really interesting conversation especially when you see that the effects of this kind of handout education is the same in in, in the western world um yeah. you know i see kids now let's say in, in spain it's not normal to see a 14, 15, 16 year old kid working. Um, and so until they leave the typical standard education, you know, 18, or if they manage to go on to university and they leave when they're 23, 24, they still have never had a, a job. They still have never received a payment. Don't know what it's like to have this kind of discipline and responsibility. Um, and yet it's the exact same. I mean, it's, it's in a, of course, a different uh, level, but the benefits I think that uh, people can have globally from maintaining a work, maintaining these kinds of responsibilities um, still apply completely to the Western world. And I mean, you that have also worked in the UK schooling, I yeah. wonder if, if you think the same way um, yeah, when it comes to those I do. kids. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that I was disillusioned. I, I When I uh, look for staff in my schools, um, Obviously, I'm looking for quality and and and, and good people that that, we, we, that like-minded individuals. Obviously, like any company, um, but there's something spe special that I'm looking for, which is someone who's disillusioned with the system but not their subject. So they still have a passion for teaching the craft of teaching, and they still want to work with young people and make a difference. And, but there's something not right about it, and and I think that there's lots of things that uh, uh, that need to change in education. And, and just to be clear, I'm not anti-education. I'm not anti-mainstream education. <laughs> no, like it's I clear. Just, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 and also I'm not in a position to say I, I know all the answers because I don't. I know I have spent my career working with children who have, who education has failed. So, and that, and that's, you know, worth mentioning. But also the children that I've worked with have a huge sense of entitlement that is actually not healthy either. 
Um, and one of the one of the things that I want to do with my work with Teabag and my schools here is reduce that level of entitlement and increase the level of awareness, because I think that the way that we do that in society at the moment is to make people feel guilty or make people feel like everyone feels like there's everyone's being told off a lot, you know, for not caring or whatever. And I just think that doesn't get you anywhere. Um, and it doesn't, it certainly doesn't help anybody in Africa or anywhere else that if, if you, if we're all just busy arguing with each other. So I, I believe in kind of being proactive and, 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 and doing something that benefits all. So one of the projects I run here is that I run a market garden. So I, uh, my students in all three schools uh, grow vegetables and fruits and they, they sow and they plant and they harvest and then they sell the vegetables in the market. Um, and uh, one of my schools is in a pub and we, had, we, can, we can sell the produce from, from the pub and coffee mornings and things. <laughs> now the profits of that business that my students run here gets invested in students out in Ghana. So the, the vocational students who leave the college, uh, they go on a small business course um, and they set up their own business. And when I say business, I mean anything from, even if it's just at the, a table at the side of the street selling, selling shoes, it, it doesn't matter what it is, it's business. And it takes an initial investment and the initial investment is practically impossible to find um, in, if you live in a village in, in, in the middle of nowhere in Ghana. So what we do is that we take the profits from um, the, the market garden and we invest it in the individuals over there. Now, what's been really annoying about COVID, apart from the obvious, is that this year we were supposed to take the students from the UK out to Ghana to meet the kids that they've invested in. And obviously that couldn't happen, but we're hoping to do it in January 2022. Um, and if that happens, I mean, oh, that, you know, that would just be the best because... And, and, the and, worlds and, collide. <laughs> yeah, and this, and this goes back to, um, like, I, I think, every, you know, when, everyone wants to make a difference or wants want to do something big. And, and I think the best way to do that is to make a big difference to a small group of people. That's what I think is, I think is the best way to do that. Like... Um, you know, I have a, a small group of people here and I have a small group of people there and I want those two people to meet and, and they can benefit from each other. Because when my kids meet those kids out there, they will stop complaining about whatever it is that they're complaining about here. <laughs> but also the kids over there won't see these kids as being like, you know, superheroes or whatever, however they view it, like magic people or whatever. Like it's yeah. just... It's just breaking down that ignorance without telling anybody off and without and by inspiring people. And it's a mutually beneficial thing. Like my kids like to, to do the market gardening and like to, you know, whatever. And, and they want to see that money spent well. And so if Cecilia is starting a bakery business out there because we sold some cabbages here in England, great, you know, and, and it's just a really small thing. Um, mm. But it's also something that can be copied. And, uh, and uh, kind of going back to your original question, you know, why teabag for me, it was because it was small and, you know, I, I, my Greenman foundation, I've kind of, along with my fellow directors and trustees and, and, and wider team, yes, we've been successful and we've grown, but we've also kind of stayed uh, agile and small because once you grow massive, you spend half your life just, uh, just being massive and just, and, and not being able to actually do the very thing that you started um, to started the thing to do in the first place. And that's why I love Teabag. Teabag is, is genuinely, it's so genuinely transparent in, in how it spends its funds. You know, Dimitri, if you, if you give me 10 euros, that 10 euros, that exact amount of money would find it, uh, find its way to a person in that village in Ghana, like that, that exact amount of money, like, when we when we travel to Ghana, that's all on our own steam. It's not you know, we that we use no charity funds whatsoever for anything other than improving the lives of not just not just the students out there, but the villagers and the teachers. Whether that's building buildings or or um, or you know or, or educating the children, it's all out there. And, and I think one of the ways that we can do that is by being small and agile and, and able to adapt. Yeah, it's so true. And that's also what we have experienced with treats. Like, it's so nice to be able to be in direct contact with everyone who's involved with the charity and to be invited to the 
trustee meetings and to actually receive pictures to know what's going on to speak to the school director it's it's so nice and we actually have um, Lisa she's um, one of our treats members um, she's a teacher back in Monaco a primary school teacher and right. um, yeah she's gonna come also and as you said I think it's so true that there are so many pre-assumptions from both sides and the best is yeah. you know for people to meet to be there to you raise all these uh yeah like images we have in our head and so. yeah yeah I think people I think you can be fooled into thinking that you can be making a difference by staying on Twitter all the time complaining about everything like that doesn't that doesn't change that's not going to change the world like you know and and um the the best way to inspire to to inspire change is is to inspire like that's that's the whole point that 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 when you feel moved to do something that's when you want to do it and 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 again another thing that I love about Teabag is that if someone came along and copied Teabag and and did exactly the same thing in another village we would be like great <laughs> you know like oh well, yeah great make a yeah. hundred you know like it, it doesn't you know, we're not, um, you know, uh, protective over over the model or anything like whatever. Like it, it's just just go and do it. Just go and do something. And I'd urge people like if you care about um, issues and you care about, you know, oh, there's so many things wrong with the world. If you care about stuff, don't just be angry, like use that passion and turn that anger into constructive energy because you know, anger doesn't do anything. If it spurs you on to, to 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 do something, then then it's then it's constructive. But if you if you just sit in your room and stay on Twitter and hate everybody, it's no good. That's actually how we started treats. I mean, the conception yeah. of it was when lockdown came and took over all of our lives. Um, everyone's passions were frustrated, and it was really an idea of okay, how do we turn this into a positive uh, outlook? And then we saw that there was an impact. And even if it was just between our friends, even if it was, you know, just our family members that joined, you know, the, the live calls or the live chats, the live sessions, um, that was already enough to motivate us into, okay, oh, how about we turn this into a platform and how about we expand this? And, you know, now we're here doing a podcast. Who would have thought that a year ago, um, you know, a, a live yoga class would have ended up in talking to, um, you know, a couple of people on, on a podcast and spreading our content throughout different places. And I mean, that's why it's also amazing that we both collaborate with um, with each other uh, because in the end, it's that same core philosophy, whether yeah. our objectives are completely different. Yeah, and, and I think that that comes across, um, you know, when when we when we guys, when we first heard about you and, and what you were doing, um, I, for one, really liked the simplicity of it. You know, it was it wasn't it wasn't like, you were coming to take over and change everything. And like, you know, it was just like, no, no, we're just going to do some yoga classes. And, and we do, it's, it's like the individual passion and the individual hobbies and the individual talents of, in, of, of the, the members of the group kind yeah. of led to this wider, um, you know, the, you know, ways that we can, we can all benefit. So I just think that that's a really lovely, just a lovely idea and, and, and such a good way to, to use this, horrible year to 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 you know for the good for the yeah. for the for good it's, it's, it's speaking great. of passions though um you, you, i mean your your whole uh, initiative in youth development is focused kind of on farming um yeah <laughs> how, how does that even come about are you a passionate farmer uh is that something that <laughs> i mean <laughs> tell us a bit more about that because it's not i mean now and nowadays it's not a, a typical thing to see okay so um, any real farmers out there would would definitely laugh at what you just said. Um, I I am a, I'm a wannabe farmer. I, I, okay. I, okay. So in the future, uh, when my work is done, you will find me in the middle of nowhere, living off the land like that yeah. with some dogs. Like that's that's definitely true. Um, in, <laughs> in some country somewhere, maybe this one. I don't know. But uh, no, I, I I really love. I do love uh, uh, farming. Um, I have a, a school on a farm, I have a school on a street, and I have a school in a pub. 
So it is the <laughs> definition of alternative education and the clues in the title, it is alternative. But when I say alternative, I don't mean that we're anti-establishment or anti-mainstream. It's not that, we're not anti-anything. We're just, we're just thinking that education is more than a memory test and more than an exam at the end of something, because that is the kind of global model. Can you remember all this stuff? And then can you do an exam? And of course it's more than that, but it kind of isn't as at the same time. And, mm. and um, I think that uh, I was a sort of an alternative kid, if you like. And, and when I look back on my school days, I don't look back fondly on the school. I look back fondly on some of my teachers who inspired me. And the way that they inspired me was to, to, to be the individual that I was and, and to be a, a better version of myself and to have that desire and work ethic, um, even though exams and things like that w weren't my cup of tea. So, um, so yeah, I, 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 I am passionate about whatever um, makes the, the education system a bit more exciting. So at the mm -hmm. moment, as you say, I'm, I'm hugely passionate about outdoor education. I think that outdoor education, is cert I mean, it, I felt this before the pandemic, post pandemic, forget about it. Like it is absolutely something that we have to do. Um, and, but more specifically outdoor education and in outdoor education, I, I include everything from, you know, sort of outdoor activities everything from beach and forest and hills and walking and running and sport and all that sort of stuff but also bushcraft and outdoor living well and fire making and 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 you know all of that sort of stuff and then of course market gardening growing and harvesting vegetables fruits growing your own food for the schools growing the food for the local community making a living from it all of that um, and lots of things that I haven't listed as well. Outdoor education, I think, is I think is such a great way to inspire kids. And because either the kids have no experience of it, in which case it's so alien to them that they'll kind of try it or they take to it because they're passionate about it and they don't feel like normal education does it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one of the things that, that that we're passionate about. But we're also passionate about experience led education as well. So in, in, in kind of the, the Western education model, you will do all your normal studies, English, math, science, blah, blah, blah. And then you will go off for some work experience, maybe a week here or a week there or whatever. And it's and it's treated like a novelty. And my point is, why is it a novelty? Why is it? Why is it not normal? So, so in our schools, for example, especially the farm school, the kids will learn maths and then they'll come out of maths and they'll go and light a fire in the woods and then they'll come back for science and then they'll go and work with horses and then they'll clear out some animals and then they'll go and do science. And there's no difference between those subjects. They're all treated on the same level. So um, very often sort of alternative schools might... <laughs> might want to do something a bit exciting say oh we're going to teach maths in a field today <laughs> and to which i say well I, I don't know just teach maths in the math classroom that's a better that's the best place to teach maths yeah but, but after maths then go out into the field and just muck around or climb trees or whatever because that's all education it's all education it's all the same it all brings something out of you um and then you, of course, you've got other things like um, yoga and mindfulness and construction and uh, whatever. Like it's it's all education, and I think that um, education should be this really huge, well-rounded experience for any kid, no matter whether they want to be a doctor or a plumber or or a computer game designer or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like it, it, it's it should be this it should be this kind of attack on the senses that's what like I, that's a wholesome I... a wholesome approach and to me also yeah. it i struggle a little bit with the world word alternative education because from everything that you're saying it's to me it sounds very wholesome and sustainable also like yeah considering the age that we live in like farming and being in contact with nature it should be something very natural since like yeah, it's good to know where your food comes from, yeah. you know, taking, considering the whole climate problem we have and everything. I think it's, for me, it's more a wholesome education than an alternative education approach. Yeah, it's kind of weird that I've, I've, I'm thinking that more and more that um, when we first started out, we would, we would, everyone thought we were kind of cowboys and, and, 
and now I spend you know f three three days out of five a week uh, talking training and to, to bringing mainstream around to our way of thinking and so I, I there is a part of me that thinks yeah why is it called alternative um mm. but then I don't know I think I think that I also I also like that it's alternative as well like I, I don't <laughs> mind I think it's I think it's good for people to be the odd one out you know I what think, I mean but I think Joe you're not going to be the odd one out for very long um I yeah, mean maybe. you see some schools now let's say California Silicon Valley where mm. uh the parents of yeah. the children have worked in Facebook Google all these startups these guys are the most connected people you can think of yeah. I mean they built the entire empire that we connect with now yeah. and they're the first ones that send their kids to these alternative schools but yeah what's i mean the alternative part is that they don't connect to social media they're trying to yeah. be outdoors more often um they're using completely non-memory device tests um i mean it seems like the people who know from the entrails of this dark beast that we call social media are the first people <laughs> that are the ones that are trying to get their own family out of it so yeah. I think actually the trend might be towards alternative uh, education. Maybe. I mean, I think I do think we have to be careful though, because and I, I do I take your point and I'm 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 glad to hear it, but I also feel the need to kind of clarify that we're not at school, we're not hugging trees and 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 like yeah. and, and like you, you know like and not that there's anything wrong with hugging trees. I mean, it's a nice thing to do, but um, <laughs> but I, I suppose what I'm saying is can't we have it all that's that's yeah, always been my point like i think for example if you take something like confidence right which is a fairly misunderstood thing right hmm. and it's very um it's kind of it's very dependent on on what you're trying to do if if if, if speaking comes naturally to you then like i always appear like i'm confident because i can talk but i'm no more confident like if i was trying to you know, do some carpentry. <laughs> you, you wouldn't see someone who's very confident. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, and so it's relative to what you're doing. But if you take something like confidence in young people and how to build confidence, which as you can imagine, you know, I've spent my career trying to do, right? And if you said to me, what is the best way to build confidence in a group of young people? I would say a great maths teacher. That will do it. Because it's not lighting fires and climbing trees and, and being with animals and stuff it's actually lots of kids want to do the thing that they can't, they think that they can't do. And maths is one of those things that if you think you can't do it, you just, it affects your whole life. And so a good math teacher that will inspire the kids into be, becoming passionate about maths, there's nothing that you do in, on planet earth that doesn't require maths. Like you it's just so need funny. Maths. It's so you, funny you that you're saying it, that. Like, I find this and so I, funny that you're saying because one of the big things that you were saying is, okay, well, well what do we remember from school? What do we remember the things that impact you? Yeah. In my case, it was uh, after school philosophy club. It was a wow. Socratic club that I signed up to. And wow. uh, first thing that they said was, okay, we're going to start reading Plato's Republic. And I was 14, 15. And they said, this is going to be a very difficult book. You're not going to understand it at all. I said, excuse me, I'm going to understand the crap out of this book. And I read you know, the pages twice over until I got it, or at least a notion of it. And then I got to the class and we had the conversation. And the moment that the teacher might say, oh, that's a good point. Or some other uh, student said, oh, that's interesting. That was it. That's all the confidence I ever needed. Just that <laughs> one moment from, oh, you won't be able to do this. And then getting to, and this is after yeah. school, mind you, you know, it's free time. It's something I chose to do out of my own volition. Um, and that was better than any uh, A plus on a science test that I ever had. Yeah, I think like yeah, I, I mean I I love that story. I think it's I think I think everybody's got a version of that story, and mm. and and I think we assume it comes from drama, swimming, climbing trees, and sport, and da da da. And it comes from all of those things, but it can also come from a good English teacher, a good math teacher, um, and. I, I I still remember like being um, writing a story in my uh, year eleven or no year ten. Uh, uh, it was off, off the back of a, a, a holiday, a summer holiday, and I wrote a story about my summer holiday, and I made my English teacher cry, like <laughs> good happy tears, you know. Yeah. And uh, and when she came in and said uh, I loved it, it made me cry. I can still remember that, and that talk about confidence boost, like that that 
you could draw a line directly from there to me, you know, writing talks or writing speeches where I, where, you know, you, that's, that's where that confidence came from when she went, yeah, you're good at this. You can mm. do it. And, and that's what teaching should be about. That's what education should be about. And, and, and that's what, I mean, that's again, going back to Ghana, that is one of the things that I feel that um, we as teachers can go over there um, to, you, you know, obviously you want to go and work with the kids because, you know, it's brilliant. It, it's, it's funny, it's heartwarming, it's wonderful. It's, it's everything that you imagine it to be. But the unexpected side of it is working with the teachers. And when you work with the teachers, a lot of it is about giving them permission to step away from the kind of Ghanaian national curriculum of you will, I mean, it's, it's very much writing on the board, blackboard, they learn it, then they do an exam. And it is literally a memory test. Like that is what it is for better or for worse. That's what it is. Um, and when we, when you talk to the uh, teachers and say, look, you can provide, you know, pastoral care to these kids. You can, you can have a conversation, you can inspire them. You can, you can believe in them. You can, you can make sure that they, you know, have experiences like you had in your philosophy club. Um, they, they, then these teachers kind of, they go, ah, oh, you know, they, they, they suddenly the, their, their whole world opens up as well. And that's how you change education. It's, it's kind of like everyone's got to have permission, you know? And I think some people in this world don't wait for permission. And, and I'm one of them. I, 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 I you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I think you should seek forgiveness rather than permission because, um, I think the world needs disrupting and the world needs to, to be, you know, jarred every now and then. And you well, it's a cultural like thing, right? I think it's a cultural thing. And I mean, you, you're in a unique perspective where you're seeing the uh, education from Ghana and from the UK. But I think, um, you know, depending on the kind of family or let's say uh, country that you're, you're born into, you can have a certain uh, belief about how much you could stick out and how much, uh, yeah. you know, here, for example, an entrepreneur, is seen as a crazy person um, in Spain, you know, uh, entrepreneur. Oh, what you're, you're going to really? leave a nine to five job that has a stable salary. And then, I mean, my, I'm half Spanish, half American. And my mother, you know, in the U S an entrepreneur is kind of like a, a basic concept. Oh, you're an entrepreneur. Okay, yeah. cool. Who's not? Who is it? I'm, yeah, also, yeah, 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 I'm yeah. also an entrepreneur. Oh, I started up my own uh, muffin business. Oh, <laughs> everyone is constantly taking risks because that's, that's ingrained into the culture of, oh, I have to make it. Um, and in you, order to make it, I have to do it on my own. What do you think the definition of an entrepreneur is? That's such a good question. Um, some, I, I would say that it's anyone who embarks on a project that, and they do it. Well, it's embarking on a project that mm. hasn't been done before or hasn't already been set up. I think okay. that's, yeah. I want to kind of keep it broad because you can be an entrepreneur in many shapes, but it yeah. doesn't just necessarily have to be, you know, setting up a, a business. I also think an entrepreneur can be setting up a charity. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I think, I, I, to, for me, it's, it's, uh, it's about failure as well. I think, I think the, I'm only speaking from my perspective. So maybe there's yeah. like a hundred uh, entrepreneurs on Twitter that would, that would hate me for saying this, but <laughs> Um, for me, I think I th it's almost like if you start if you start something and it becomes successful in whatever whatever that means to you, like financially successful, morally successful, whatever. Um, the assumption that other people look at it and go, "Oh, he or she did that and and they were successful," but the reality is. Like behind that one thing was like hundred failures, <laughs> hundred mistakes, mm -hmm. terrible yeah. like. You know, and um, so for me, I think that the, the secret that entrepreneurs maybe have is maybe an increased sense of resilience or an increased sense of um, failure. And, and, and so they're just not bothered by it. Like if I was, you know, I, 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 I do consider myself an entrepreneur and um, I'm kind of proud of it, weirdly. I don't know. I don't know why. Like I just yeah. because I just feel like it's the only gang that I could possibly be in, <laughs> and um, and and the most important part of that is is my relationship with failure. I think I think yeah. I think it, I mean going back to education. I think we need to raise a generation of kids who are excited by failure, because you know, it's, all of it's, yeah. 
Elon, Elon Musk, who at the moment is, I mean, he's one of the most famous entrepreneurs at the time. And uh, mm-hmm. in a conference, they asked him, uh, is there any kind of motivational words that you give to entrepreneurs or any tips? And he said, if you need motivational words or any tips, don't be an entrepreneur. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. It, that, like, for me, that defines it perfectly. It should be. Yeah, it should be. It's mm. we need to raise a generation of kids who are excited by failure because all across the world there are kids sitting in classrooms who know the answer to the question but won't put their hands up. And for as long as that's a problem, then 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 the education system globally is failing these kids. And because there's a fear of failure and a fear of change and a fear of looking like an idiot. And and I think if you can if you can dispel those myths, um, that's that then then we could change the world that that's the one thing that 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 i think is i think is lacking like when i i mean we talk about the generation coming up now as being a lost generation <laughs> ludicrous <laughs> um they're a found generation they are not lost they are more switched on they're more aware they are more um confident in terms of what is possible out there um, um. and it's our job like looking you know as just a little bit further down the road than them to say to them don't worry about failure don't worry about mistakes don't worry about looking like an idiot like just don't worry about that and and just focus on um you know making the world a better place by making small changes like say big 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 changes to a small group of people i think that's that's because the more people that do that the better and that and that takes us back to, to to teabag because um like i said our hope is that you know when you guys come out there in in real life you know um and like with us being in the same place when we're on the beach in ghana something will happen something will happen we won't have to plan anything because something will happen we will see something we will talk about something we will have ideas and then we will make it happen and that's that kind of entrepreneur spirit i think that is get that gets forgotten about it's about the the ability to make something from nothing and 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 to drive something forward for no other reason than let's do it like let's 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 make a difference let's do something amazing and um i would i would love that to be more included in in education i don't know why it isn't i don't know why it isn't i think we we're so busy telling children that they could be anything they say you could be anything you want to be uh, but don't know. fail at whatever you choose <laughs> yeah, yeah it's kind of contradictory <laughs> like um i don't know but, but it, that's only if you say you could be anything then if you're not providing them with anything everything, or with yeah. everything like like that's yeah. sort of bad advice whereas you mm. could go mm. let's experience lots of different things and see see which one you like and see which which stuff that you think is interesting and you know anyway. i have uh One last question for you. You're so passionate about self-development and, you know, teaching people how to bring out their skills and walk through life with that, like trying to make your career out of that. How, like, how did that come to you? How did you get so passionate about that? Or did Um, it come to you? (laughs) Yeah, um, I am very passionate about self-development. But not, but I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> if, if I'm if I'm anti anything, it's anti perfectionism. Um, I I I often say I never met a happy perfectionist. Uh, even even though I I think I am one actually. I think I am secretly a perfectionist. Um, I think perfectionism in 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 the world is is just not good for us. It's not good for society. It's not nature. Nature is wonderfully like perfectly imperfect that's that like and and human beings the the thing that makes us interesting is our flaws and our mistakes and our failures and our regrets all of the things that we spend our life trying to ignore and forget about and um i really worry about a society that wants to be without flaws i think that's just i think that's really depressing i think that's horrible i, I don't i don't get it um so my take on self improvement is not about perfectionism and it's not even a, it's not even about bettering yourself to get a better job or a better life or more money i think i see it more philosophically as you know we have 80 years if we're lucky on a floating rock and you know what are you going to do with it like what what's what's going to happen and and i for one with the with the dawn of the technological age of the internet and 
um, audio books and podcasts and, and YouTube and films, everything is right there on our phone, right there. Why not, why not use it? Why not like learn as much as we possibly can? So self-improvement, I come from that perspective. Um, and in terms of the self-improvement that I, that I do in my coaching, um, coaching is not about telling people what to do and it's not therapy. It's not about looking back and finding reasons for, for why you feel what you feel. It's about kind of unleashing that sort of, um, I guess maybe it's just permission, giving people permission to, to be whatever they want to be within, within the realms and getting excited about the talents that are already there in themselves. Mm. Um, I think that's how I see it. Um, in answer to your question about how I came about, um, I, I was ill. That's that's the truth. I, I was ill. I was burnt out. I, I um, at my most successful professionally, I was my least healthy. Mm. I I was um, I was working too long hours. I was stressed. I was not good to be around. I was eating terribly, and I was just I was just crap. I mean that that's the, that's the truth of it. Um, and I had to get better. And and so when I started to get better. I originally took, um, uh, I, I got, got some therapy and I originally took uh, antidepressants and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I could not believe, um, I mean, th they didn't make me better. <laughs> for me, I was taking pills to, for other people to be better. So they would say, oh, Joe's back to being normal again. And I was like, what? That, that, that doesn't make any sense. So this pill that would, would that would mask all these feelings and by the way they work they do work there's no doubt about it they do they do do what they set out to do which is mask those feelings and, and make you feel a bit better but what they don't do is they don't educate you they don't they don't improve your soul they don't mm -hmm. give you a passion for life um for me they made me numb and they made me less interesting and um mm -hmm. so uh, with you know, when you when you have a tendency to go up there or down there, you the only thing that really helps you, I think, is 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 a, is improving um, it's information, just information, just coming and coming at you and understanding more about who you are and what you do and and how you do it. And that's what that's what kind of drove me to that point. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm grateful for burnout. I, I um, I'm a better person because I burnt out. If I if I hadn't burnt out, I wouldn't have. Uh, three schools I wouldn't have gone to Ghana I wouldn't have improved my own life I'd still be just working too long and and been really stressed and being really defensive about you know how important my job is you know and yeah that's ridiculous I think you know these dark moments can really like teach a lot and in, in mm. your life and see things like you see things in a different perspective after it's funny the way you were answering the question before is very much like a quote from Marilyn Monroe that I read today and it says imperfection is beauty madness is genius it's better to be absolutely ridiculous than absolutely boring <laughs> definitely oh Marilyn I couldn't agree more yeah <laughs> I, I just I just think I, I, I it's it's the only thing it's the only thing that I'm worried about really apart from massive things like climate change and and global poverty you know all those huge things that that, that are so overwhelming the thing that makes me fearful um, in society more than anything is this sense that um we all need to be sensible and we all need to be we all need to say the right things and we all need to get in line and, and that terrifies me because i'm naughty i'm i'm i'm, I'm i break rules I, I i you know and and that's how i learn that's and and so i'm not i don't think i'm ever going to claim to be anything other than a really flawed individual and so i don't really want to hang out with people that are kind of perfect I, I, I just don't I'm like what will we talk about <laughs> you know like yeah. um, I, and, and to me society isn't that it's it's and 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 you and you learn that again you learn that when you go somewhere like Ghana because within I mean you'll know this Sophie within half an hour of being in Ghana you know whatever you thought you knew you didn't know right you you know you, you the, the drive from the airport to the village 
you're like, all right, wow. And you, you know, you could, you could see anything, anything on that drive, absolutely anything. And your judgment goes out the window because you're like, well, all right, fine. I don't, I don't know anything. And that's yeah. good for people. It's good for people. It's, it's good for people to be humbled and to, and to just being surprised every now and then and to, to not judge, judge anybody. Yeah, we can definitely learn a lot from each other. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Do you, so, do you, do you, what was your, what was your experience when you first went to Ghana, Sophie? Um, very uh, overwhelming in, in lots of ways. Um, um, very hard to describe, but um, so for sure, I've, I felt that a lot of like, uh, I just felt the people and the atmosphere was so yeah. peaceful, even though it was so hectic and so rumbling. Yeah. And so yeah. it's hard to describe, but um, uh, it's definitely like a place. I think the more you go, like it takes some time to, to understand the culture yeah. for me as a German, at least. Um, and even though I had lived in Africa before, but it's just uh, a place to it's, it, gets more exciting every time you go i think i, d I definitely agree but with that. um yeah, yeah carlos yeah. did you have some did you want to do the yeah i mean i don't want to run away too much from this very interesting topic but i mean yeah. we are mindful of the time so um <laughs> we'd like to conclude our podcast with a little quick game uh mm -hmm. we call it this or that where we basically have our guests choose between two choices it's really as simple as that and we might ask you why <laughs> um so we'll start off with uh pastry battle or let's say sorry a dish battle uh so sunday roast versus english breakfast oh, sunday roast no sunday like roast. no debate you didn't even have to think about it no way <laughs> absolutely sunday roast okay yeah. every sunday always no matter what nice yeah so yeah. um we uh we know english english breakfast i must apologize that on behalf of my country I, you know i hate that we're famous for an english breakfast like, just basically I mean, a heart attack a heart attack on a plate well yeah. on, a, on a hangover it's uh, quite thing uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so uh we saw that you're a, a fan of vans so um how about if you could choose between a vw or a ford transit uh, well, hang Ford on. Transit. <laughs> wait, wait, what year? Old or, or old or now? Well, uh, uh, VW, wanna... VW, VW, VW. Yeah. Done. VW. Really? Yeah, VW. You don't want like to be it... able to stand in your van? You can stand in a VW. Uh, yeah, you can have, you can have, uh, you know, the pop-up roofs and yeah. Oh, right. my, it okay, was my okay. first car. My first car was a Beetle. Then my second car was a Camper. Like, yeah, I'm VW. Wow, okay. all the way. Yeah, yeah. VW loyal. Okay. <laughs> although, <laughs> although weird. Can I tell you? Uh, weirdly, my van that I have, my 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 pride and joy, that is a Ford. So I'm 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 stupid. So <laughs> like, yeah. So I, that is, I mean, it's really hard, but I love both of them. So, but yeah, okay. mine, mine is technically a Ford Transit. Yeah. We also know that you are a, a dog lover. Um, yeah. So between Golden Retriever or Cocker Spaniel, if you had to choose. Go I mean, are you a big dog or a, a small dog kind of guy? All dogs, all dogs. Okay. I, I, I think that dogs are like humans with the bad stuff taken out like i i love that's so true <laughs> all dogs. any dog any size naughty dogs smelly dogs like ugly dogs <laughs> just dogs but <laughs> but um golden retriever i think is just it's stunning oh god mm. i mean yeah. like yeah they're all but they're all brilliant they're all brilliant <laughs> okay and the final one um Related a bit more to like sport and healthy lifestyle, running or yoga. Well, surfing is my favorite. Uh, okay. okay, I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose yoga, right? But I need to clarify this. Go for it. I hate running. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> I don't know anyone who does actually. We talked to an oh. athlete last month for for the previous podcast, and he's an athlete who makes a living out of running. He doesn't like running. <laughs> I, do, I, I have a theory so, about running. I think, it's, I think it's not good for you. 
<laughs> well, there's a lot of studies out there that would agree with you. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm but, just joking. But no, I, I, but I, but I must clarify. I, I need to do yoga. I, I need to do it, and I yeah. don't do it, and I need to do it. I need Sophie to teach me yoga because um, I'm not flexible anymore, and um, I also I haven't got the concentration for yoga. So it is something that I need to learn. I need to work on it. I need to get better. And out of the two, yeah, I'm going to choose yoga. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So thanks a lot, Joe, uh, for, the, for the call today. Uh, really no was problem. a wonderful chat. Uh, we'd love to have it again and have you back over. No um, and yeah, I don't know if you will have any, any parting words for the audience. <laughs> Uh, just to say thank you really just to say thank you for treats to for the donations and 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 for the work that you've done to help our little charity and you won't realize like the difference it makes until you go there and so i, I look forward to to being there with you and and you actually getting to see what your money is spent on because that's when you'll really realize but um on behalf of my charity and and, and the, my, my fellow trustees we we are so grateful for for you to just take an interest and and just we we just we just think it's great so thank you very much to all who contribute in small ways and big ways we're really really grateful thank you thank you <laughs> have a great afternoon guys bye bye